This week on Barbell Shrugged, we talk about why to compete and how to prepare for the open. Did it become from this? To this? I was told the bread was paleo. Camera ready? I do, I do. <laughs> Two, Here one, we... go. We're like, where's the camera at? Here we go. Oh, right, right, right. Here we go. Put it's it coming. on my asshole. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> All right, welcome to Barbell Shrug. I'm Mike Bledsoe here with Doug Larson and Christopher Moore. Mm. And of course, behind the camera is the magnificent CTP. You going by Christopher now? No. <laughs> <laughs> is this does it make me sound smarter? Am I more very distinguished? Author, Christopher, author, Christopher, well, Christopher you're writing Moore. books now, so I have to. You know, it's more of a distinguished name. I got to work on my pretentiousness. Yeah, I got to amp it. Where up. is your book? Downstairs. <laughs> oh, you should bring that Fail. so you can promote it. <laughs> you should not bring it in the studio. <laughs> All right, when we take a break, we'll okay. come back up. We'll get a, we'll get a copy. We'll show it to the fans. I will. Yeah, good. Yeah. All right. So today we will be talking about the After. open. Oh wait. <laughs> Right, no, you know, uh, we got to do the hook, then the promo. We have an opening. They already, saw, out they already day, saw the opening. Oh. Damn. <laughs> Remember how this works? <laughs> we only do it every week. I'm so confused. Is your beard on too tight today? <laughs> the beard is on way too tight. <laughs> Choking the breath. Yeah, make sure you guys go over to uh, barbellstruck.com. Uh, sign up for the newsletter. If you do that, you will get the eight snatch mistakes you might be making that could keep you from hitting. Big PRs. Rich Froning with his abs there. You'd be so excited to lift. Yeah, we get to hang out with Rich Froning and uh, learn how to do snatches better. No, Rich. Not like that. Do it like this. You coached him up. I was like, come on, Rich. Stop screwing this quit, up. Quit moving so bad, Rich. Come on. <laughs> uh, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about what, prepping for the Open, right? Or just competition in general, really. Mm -hmm. so well, why, yeah. why are we talking about this, Doug? <laughs> why are competitions important? Doug, Doug was so adamant. About bringing this topic up. I'm just kidding. No. I think everyone should compete in the open. There's no reason not to. It's the easiest competition to sign up for. It's in your gym. You don't have to travel. What's the 20 bucks? How much is it? $20. It's like $20. And I know plenty of people are out there going, yeah, but 20 bucks. I have, I have so many things. I got to go to that thing and I got to... My that thing is due. I don't know if I really can spend twenty dollars on this. Twenty dollars. Twenty dollars is easily justified just in the fact that you can compare your results to like a hundred thousand other people. The data. That's cool. The, shit. the leaderboard alone. The, the, yeah. the coolest part of that whole this whole event is it's a huge, brand new kind of experiment with such a huge sample size. Where if you get involved, you'll, you'll you'll be able to automatically get so much data to make yourself better. You don't get that from power of the meat or weight of the meat. And by the way, for those meats you pay for one shitty meat that maybe you don't even compete against anybody at and doesn't really make you better, this is a fun thing to do. You might pay a hundred bucks to do that. How much is good weight of the meat? Power of the meat's about a hundred bucks entry fee always. Uh, it varies with weight of the meats, twenty to a hundred. It yeah, kind of depends. And you have a membership fee. Yeah, membership it. dues. That you probably have to pay to get in the thing, and you got to travel. And this is a really awesome idea and concept I've never seen before in my yeah I've, I, I've heard people complain career. about the $20 thing like what are they doing with that money they're just so greedy I'm like it's it's a twenty dollars. It's an event on a massive I bet, scale. I bet that website costs like a hundred k to ma build and maintain. Like it's expensive. Yeah. Have you ever built yeah. a website like that? And before you got you got to pay a guy to do that. Two hundred thousand registrants. You got to pay the now. media team to keep track of all the results and post that every day and have the mechanism to filter the results and show you the data for twenty bucks. It's laughably an important thing. Like you must do this if you're interested at all in CrossFit. Do anyone it. who complains about that, I can guarantee you, spent. 20 bucks if you complain about that you <laughs> also 5K, complain you also 5k can, shitty t-shirt yeah and you complain about well you complain about life's not fair and you can't do what you want to do and what was me and my boss doesn't know shit you're that kind of guy and you're <laughs> <laughs> you shut the f up yeah. I know you Sorry. get something fun to do for five weeks in a row like, five weeks in a row. That's that a language long time. CTP's whistle. That language is harsh. I backed that up. for five weeks. I revised you that. Have to, you have to bleep that out. Yeah, bleep it. Uh, you don't have to travel. You're going to do it in your home gym. Hell, you can do it in your garage and mm -hmm. video it if you want. Yeah. Talk about low low barrier to entry for sure. I spent $100 on a grappling tournament. Got there. Had one match that was like five minutes long. Lost. Travel back home. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 100 bucks. 
Twenty dollars oh, is well terrible. worth it. Terrible. <laughs> so just competing in general, like I say this all the time, like you should, you, you should always balance learning, practicing, and doing. So learning, reading books, listening to podcasts, whatever, practicing, going and training and, and actually experiencing what it's like and, mm-hmm. and trying to get results off of actual practice. Man, and that's then, a good point, man. And then signing up for a competition is the doing part. You have to do that to see if everything you've learned and everything you've practiced actually works. You see, if you real. never test yourself, <laughs> yeah. if you never test yourself, then you don't know if what you're doing is really really working as well as you think it's working. Yeah, you can you can hit a PR in the gym and yeah, you obviously got stronger, but, but doing it in competition where, where you're being judged mm-hmm. and you're competing against other people is really the best way to like see if everything you've put your heart and soul into is actually coming, coming What's through. What's really anymore. different about that format is that usually if, if you're doing a competition, even CrossFit, you're at one place <clears throat> and your results the, are all relative to whoever shows up to that event in that area who's interested in that sport there. So if you do well or bad, it doesn't really mean anything. But if it's if you're in an event with 300,000 people, mm-hmm. you know exactly with a large amount of confidence where you are. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way. Yeah, of, being, it's there's so a powerful. lot of people who are the best in their gym. And like, oh, people, I'm the best. I'm the best. And then they go and the they best. sign up and they're the 502nd best in their region. Yeah. yeah. Or you have a really good Fran time because for whatever reason, you're kind of built to do those those short workouts like Fran is and you never do any of these other types of workouts. So you always do the workouts you're really good at and you kind of avoid this other stuff that's in, I know that's how in, that your, is. That's in your shadow. <laughs> Boy, and howdy. Signing up for a competition where you have no idea what, what's going to be thrown at you really is an easy way to expose your weaknesses. So if you want to be truly well-rounded, like CrossFit is supposed to be promoting, they're supposed to be super well-rounded athletes, you have to sign up for competition. That way, you get something thrown at you that you didn't expect, and then you can kind of rise to, to that to that new expectation and see, yeah. you know, just see what happens. If, if you don't ever do that, then you're going to have those weaknesses forever. Yeah, I think a lot of people pick and choose workouts. They jump from, like, blog to blog, or they program for themselves. No and they program the stuff they like, the stuff they're good at. And there's no direction. There's no and, uh, continua- you know, continuity yeah. between ideas. You're not linking things together in a progressive way. Yeah, I've been there myself, like programming <laughs> yeah. for myself, and then you go to a competition and you get smashed and you're like, oh, I was not yeah. looking over there. And I would say one more thing about this whole venue is that what's really cool, like most things in CrossFit, it's easy to talk shit about it up front, like fuck that sport. These guys are all just doing stupid shit. They're not periodizing. They're not getting strong. Meanwhile, that was true. Now it's not true. Now a guy runs a marathon and fucking clean and jerks almost 400 pounds. He's stronger than you. <laughs> I don't give a shit. You, so you're wrong. But people talk shit about the format of this competition like crazy, did they not? Like, how are you going to have a video submission for a, people going to say whatever they want? They can lie. They can cheat. They can steal. That hasn't happened. People have tried to cheat. You'll see one guy like crush a wad and like number one in the world for a week. And then because it's a huge sample and because you can't be cheating forever and because you will get discovered, that gets washed out. I haven't I, seen any of that, really. I do know uh, one one person It was highly, it was one of those things where it was, I wouldn't say that she was cheating, but the reps Stretching were it. not. You want to name names? No, I'm not going to name names. <laughs> uh, the, people were pointing out that this score was just not humanly possible. And what happened? They pointed it out. Uh, well, yeah, and then she got she got banned from the whole year. Yeah, you can't hide. It, that's so like, it's, it's really like unfortunate because wicked... I think she was a really good athlete, and someone made a mistake somewhere, but it didn't get by. So that was the important That's where the part, open source yeah. format really works. You can't pull that off. You can't just tell people, oh, I snatched that. I, I'll tell them because you're going to have to back it up. And people know, like, if you did better than Rich Froning in a wad, people are going to say, is that real? <laughs> so, uh, Nick, Nick Ranker last year, I think it was, was mm. uh, he had done one of the wads. I think he was, I, th- I want to say it was the one with the muscle ups. And somebody saw the video and goes, oh, you know, two of those muscle ups, you didn't, you know, extend all the way at the top or something like that. And he <laughs> goes, okay. So he went and shot another video, did it all over again. I think he scored. I think he may have even scored better. Oh, now no. what? And, and Nick's a, a fantastic athlete. Like, and he what? Went to regionals. Now what? So like people, <laughs> yeah, people who maybe like shit talk it, and they're like, oh, you know, you're not really finding the best athletes. Yeah, I mean the the cream is going to rise to the top and over a five week period. It's, and it's actually, I know it seems so cutting edge and different. There's a lot of change involved. It's so different than what people are used to. But think of the shenanigans, shenanigans that go on in any other kind of competition for powerlifting or weightlifting or. Uh, maybe even like even sports like, like think of all the shit that people get away with like bad lifts pass like that exists already this is a better this is a very interesting better step forward this open source huge group of people all participating in one thing you're finding the actual best person I love it yeah and the open is actually a really new idea I mean CrossFit is a is technically in its infancy as a sport and as a business and all that type of stuff 
Uh, but the open itself is only is, we've done it for three years now 11 uh, 11 12 and 13 mm-hmm. and so it's you know the first year I think it was a little shaky they had to read ended up being six wads when it was supposed to be five because something I, I can't remember off the top of my head something got screwed up somewhere in the scoring or or something People happened so, the website oh, yeah. yeah the website people are so quick to the criticize. website screwed up oh, yeah. and then they had to like and so that was the first year mm-hmm. yeah and people were like oh my god I paid $20 see, for this <laughs> see why it's bad it's like people like right. just because there's a initial hiccup doesn't mean it's a bad idea don't be so critical people Come yeah on. but it's been three years so we have uh you know the first year you didn't know what to expect and then like every week you were going oh is it gonna be another AMRAP you know, it's like, oh, first week's an AMRAP. What will next week be? Now Doug can tell you. It's another AMRAP. <laughs> well, anybody and, can tell you. And what's the next week? I feel like for our new people, we should explain that this is how you get to the games. Do we do that? <laughs> We're getting there. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> yeah, mo- most people probably already know that. But yeah, you do the Open, then if you qualify, you go to regionals, and then eventually, if you're good enough, you go to the games. So that's Sorry why, that's why this is such a big deal. Hopefully most people knew that, but there might be like 10 people out there. <laughs> I got your back. It's very right true. Some people might not know that. So I yeah. nailed this, and then what happens? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. So like the first year, it was like, oh, they're gonna do nothing but AMRAPs. Like, and that we're like, oh, it was a little disappointing because one of the things that CrossFitters love is variety. And mm-hmm. when you get sit, hit with like the same, uh, what would that be called? Time domain. <laughs> I don't know. It's not get, so mixed modal domain. Let's not get too I mean? far into those weeds. Same style yeah. of workout. Yeah, but uh, so but we now know it's probably due to scoring. I'm not. It, I'm 99 percent sure that it's easier to score AMRAPs than it is uh, to to mix it up from wad to wad. So we've got three years knowing that we're doing uh, AMRAPs, and we know what Doug you ran the numbers. What are the what are we Doug dealing on, with? What what type of time domains are we dealing with? Doug put on glasses with a little tape on them. He got out a calculator. He sat down with a, all the coffee and he ran the fucking numbers. Doug's middle some, name some is serious, actually spreadsheet. scientific research. Crunching shit. Spreadsheet over here. Right. So yeah, nothing complicated about this, but yeah, over the last three years they've all been AMRAPs. That's historical data. It doesn't really mean that all the all the open wads in the future are going to be AMRAPs. They could be whatever the hell CrossFit wants them to be. So uh, but we do know that that historically is what what has happened and uh, I think the, the range has been between 5 and 20 minutes. They usually average around uh, 11 or 10 or 11 minutes long. So uh, you know, prepping for the open, you know, you gotta you gotta think about doing workouts that are right around that time domain. You don't need to do a whole lot of really long wads. Doing some shorter wads is probably probably a good thing. You know, people that compete in the mile and two mile, they run lots of uh, 400 meter sprints, 200 meter sprints, 800 meter sprints, so you can work on that pace. But uh, knowing that you're right around that that 10 minute AMRAP is something really good to know. Growing going into one of these type of competitions. Yeah, if you look at athletes that are doing like the really really long stuff to prep for. Uh, the CrossFit season, a lot of times they're people who are looking towards regionals or the games. And so their training, overall training volume and the, and the volume of individual workouts are going to be a lot higher. Uh, mm-hmm. But yeah, as Doug was saying, it's not, a, you're, you're training for a, a 10 minute workout or an event. So, uh, you know, doing hour and a half long runs and stuff like that may not be uh, the most appropriate things for your training. <laughs> Yeah, or even even running at all as something that you're practicing for the open isn't maybe the best use of your time. There's never been any running in any of the open workouts. I mean, if you're trying to to design a workout that hundreds of thousands of people can do all throughout the world, and they're doing video submissions and they're being judged by people that aren't that aren't really experienced in in a lot of cases, mm-hmm. um, being able to accurately measure a distance, you know, for a guy that's in Washington state and a guy that's in Kenya and a guy that's in, in China, and then have, have that distance be the uphill, exact same uphill, downhill, sea level weather is fucking impossible. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, not- <laughs> sea level. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, if I live in fucking, you know, in, in Tibet and you live in Florida and we're running, it's not fair, is it? <laughs> if I'm crossfitting in Tibet in oh, my that, monk outfit. That, that would be any not exercise. Fair. <laughs> That's why I was like, what? That's why I never crossfit in Tibet. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure, though, like if you can do like f- fucking five deadlifts, yeah. it's just a different thing. It's, well, it's not as great. When, a, when a are crossfitters going to start you know, living at altitude? That's what I want to know. I mean, they are some already are, but does that give them an edge? I don't know. I worked out in the altitude that one time. Remember, that was pretty sweet. Colorado walked into a Walmart and I thought the lights were turning on. <laughs> oh yeah, you, you were uh, you had like a psychedelic psychedelic trip from exercise. Yep, yeah. that's altitude. Oh, baby. where was this? How the hell you guys are talking about? But is that was that in Colorado? Oh yeah, he was in Colorado and he went for like he went and did a wad. Why? And then he came back and he was like completely out of breath and exhausted. And then we were at we we're at Walmart. 
doing some grocery shopping. He was like, I feel really funny. And all of a sudden, like, the lights <laughs> flickered in the building. He's like, was that me or did that really happen? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> but the timing was impeccable. Right. Luckily, altitude sickness strikes a little higher elevation than the Walmart in Denver. <laughs> <laughs> Probably right. at 10 times that height. So we know the workouts are 10, 11 minutes long on average. What are, what are the big movements that we have to look out for, Doug? Since you did ran all the data, or do actually, I don't have that list in front of me, but <sighs> but it's all the basics. Let me. It's it's thrusters and cleans or clean and jerk snatches. Um, as far as the barbell movements go, um, what, were the, what were the other few barbell movements? We other had barbell push, movements. Push presses was one of them. There were seven yeah, or eight barbell and movements overhead. and seven or eight regular movements. Yeah, a lot of times we'll just listen to shoulder overhead, so you can jerk it if you want, or just press well, it. core fundamental shit. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, the core barbell movements. Uh, and then they also have what, burpees, muscle ups, double unders, wall ball shots, pull ups, pull ups, chest to bar pull ups specifically. Uh, I don't think pull-ups. they've ever programmed anything other than chest to bar pull ups. So uh, I, for me personally, I program pull ups occasionally, but we work a lot on chest to bar pull ups. Yeah. So they're drilling for that reason. They're drilling the fundamentals of movement and CrossFit staples as deeply as possible. Like, let's find out who this is fundamentally as sound as can be. Then go up in difficulty from there. I think they do the chest of our pull-ups just because it's uh, easy to judge. Yeah, you got there. You but got when there. you get to regionals, they, they'll have like workouts with just pull-ups. So, I don't know. Yeah, but, but they do all the basics. There's there's never been any kettlebell movements, likely because there's, you know, of the hundreds of thousands of people all over the world, they, maybe they don't have access to RX kettlebells in most cases. And, and I would imagine CrossFit wants the, the most amount of people possibly to uh, to be involved in the open. The more people, yeah. the better for the most part. It helps grow the sport and helps grow awareness about the sport. So there's never been any kettlebell movements. There's never been any like heavy yoke walks or, or prowler pushes. <coughs> odd um, lifts and stuff. Yeah, no no, no odd lifts, no learning, no, nothing novel, nothing new. They save all that stuff for regionals and, and especially the games. There's probably, a lot of, if you a lot learn of novel it, stuff in the if, games. If you learn it at a level one seminar, that's probably the, the stuff you've got to know. Yeah, pretty much. Like, And again, no running just because it's so hard to confirm that everyone is doing the exact same distance. Uh, no rowing because, again, a lot of people probably don't have access to a, what, seven, $800 piece of equipment like a rower. So it's basically just like all the, the core fundamental barbell movements and body weight-ish movements. I'd say uh, double unders, you need a jump rope. Obviously, wall balls, you need a, a wall ball. And... Uh, box jumps you need a box to jump onto but for the most part it's like bare minimum as far as equipment yeah and w- there's no one rep maxes like uh, we've, there's never been programmed like find your one rep max snatch or clean and jerk or anything like that uh, so working on that one rep max strength uh, preparing for that for the open is probably not a great idea uh, you know it's good to find your to uh, improve your one rep max strength over you know I think that's really important during the off season but as you get closer uh, you know, what you can do with a pretty heavy weight for multiple reps is probably a little more along the lines you need to be going. Yeah, you're not going to be tested on that specifically in the open. So if you're if you're working on your conditioning, your muscular endurance, and kind of your your uh, your anaerobic endurance, your short interval type endurance, speed endurance, then you don't need to worry if your max drops 10, 15 pounds. As, yeah. as long as as long as your your strength goes down maybe just a tiny bit at most, maybe you just maintain, but your fitness goes way high prior to the open. That's really what you want to focus on. Not strength Peaking your for, strength right before the open is not a necessity. Not strength for strength's sake, strength for, for building efficiency and quality of motion. Yeah, like I've actually made that the, mistake in the past, you know, with the weightlifting mentality is like, oh, we gotta have like peak, you know, speed, power, and, and force output right beforehand. It's like, well, that is not a piece of the pie in the open. <laughs> you gotta uh, get the base yeah. of your pyramid aligned with the height of your. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, wise one. That's right. Here, I, I pulled up uh, how, the eight. The eight how tall is pyramid, movements. Mike? How tall is pyramid? It's as wide as its base. As wide as its base, of course. Chris. Oh, God. How did you know Every that? Every asshole yeah. knows this. I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> the quiz right, master. So here are the, the, eight, the eight non-barbell movements were double unders, push-ups, box jumps, burpees, toes to bar, pull-ups, muscle-ups, and wall balls. And then as Mike said, that was chest to bar pull-ups. Uh, the seven Fresh barbell easy. movements were snatches, mm. cleans, jerks, push presses, overhead squats, thrusters, and deadlifts. So bare bones basics as far as CrossFit's concerned. Yeah, the other thing I find uh, interesting mm. is the, the chest to bar pull-ups. Uh, I, I find that as a uh, people spend year-round doing pull-ups. And they'll throw in chest bar pull-ups sometimes. And it should probably be the other way around. And a lot of times the ability to string, if you can't string together like five chest bar pull-ups, it's probably more of like an absolute strength issue than it is like your ability just 
just doing more pull-ups probably isn't going to be beneficial. There's, yeah, you, you probably it, need to fill a deficiency it's somewhere. It's like if you do like a bunch of bodyweight squats like for hundreds of reps, but yet you don't squat your body weight. It's like, well, you should probably just uh, get stronger, then work some more reps. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that chest to bar pull-ups aren't the standard. Usually the full range of motion thing, like the, the, the longest range of motion possible, especially in CrossFit, tends to be the standard. You go ass to ankles on squats, assuming you have good technique. You don't just hit parallel or do quarter squats as the standard. Parallel isn't the standard, and then you get to a competition and they're like, oh, Oh, nope, all the way down in this competition. Ass to grass is always the standard. And then in CrossFit, they never do just parallel as the standard. But for pull ups, chest to bar should be the standard. And then if you get to yeah. a competition and it's just a regular pull up, you should be like, fuck Bonus. yeah, this is awesome. We rattle out a bunch of these. Yeah. So Bonus, it's, it's, it's interesting that it's switched for pull ups for some reason. Yeah, probably just because uh, a lot of people can't do them. <laughs> yeah. But then That's they, their problem. And they throw them at the end, they open. So, this, they, so what you'll like, find is at the beginning of the open, the movements are. More simple, uh, hard, and then as the as it goes on, that's where you're gonna find the muscle ups, so, chest bar pull ups. So it seems like, like one of the keys to your success in this competition. I'll maybe I'm just a fat pal that doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. But let me <laughs> let me air this idea out, would you? Uh, it seems like it's a time for honesty and humility and, and reality checking. Like, look, if I'm gonna do well, I may be good at lots of things, but I gotta go back and make sure that. I carefully look at things that I may not think are so like maybe you think it's a little bit beneath you to go back and drill your just basic pull up technique or really analyze your muscle ups if you think you're good at them to really step back and go am I really are my fundamentals as sounds like could be because they're going to drill this shit like they're going to really test you if you're scared of facing your goat if you know that that part of that thing is not what you want to do and you're going to try to make a run at this you really have to gut check and say look I need to really scrape into these things I know I'm not that good at or I think I need data to tell me if I if I'm just making a big assumption that my chest to bar pull up is just fine or yeah. my, my I, muscle time, like I, I can do five muscle ups not a problem maybe it's a huge fucking problem yeah, maybe I, you just don't want to face at it. One time I thought seven unbroken muscle ups was good. Yeah. And now like you know I think you need to be doing at least fifteen if you're gonna score it's decent. There's gonna be a lot yeah. of people every year who go you know what I think I'm I'm really ready and because they aren't really looking for the data they just don't know how far off they are. They know and they get they, really and they get really disappointed and beat themselves up for not being good enough when they they finish like a thousandth out of a thousand and one they go fuck i guess i'm i'm well, terrible well no i mean you, you, you have a really shitty attitude <laughs> yeah it depends on your goal i guess you know uh, feeling like you're in the best shape of your life i find that to be very important for me now well i feel uh, great now <laughs> right now so i mean you talk about this you talk about this in your book you know being happy with the progress you're making mm-hmm. and not getting wrapped up in the what other people are accomplishing and so I think the open is a good opportunity to kind of see where you really are and what's really possible, maybe raising your standards. But I also wouldn't get too wrapped up in, oh, I didn't get to, I didn't qualify for regionals. You know, I think, yeah, that, that's I want to like, talk about that a little bit is like, you yeah. know, if you don't qualify for, for regionals, you know, and, but you're in the best shape of your life, there's no reason to get down on yourself because you can't control what's happening elsewhere but the standards now been raised for you your expectations and now that's somewhere you can go in the future and you guess you use the urgency and the the lure and the the drive of the goal because that's what we want to compete we want to try our best to get there it's just that you don't beat yourself up if you don't get there and use that impetus that that drive to make you take the close look at everything you're ignoring all, all the things that are below your radar now that you really need to scratch into like yeah i haven't really taken the time to consider whether this fundamental thing is on point now i should yeah. That's a great yeah. reason to compete right there because you dig up all these little skeletons you're hiding. Yeah, yeah. I do like the Open for beginners because it's a competition that you don't have to go into it um, after doing a super high volume of training leading up to it. I mean, if you want to go to regionals and games, you, you definitely need to be prepared for that, but that's, that's after the Open. For a beginner... Uh, you go to a competition, most regular competitions even are two or three wads in one day. Like if you are, have been doing higher volume training, you'll be able to handle two or three or, or more wads in one day, especially two or three wads in a day and then two or three wads the next day. But the open isn't like that at all. It's one single wad and then you have a whole week to recover and then another single wad. So if you haven't been doing super high volume training, you can still tolerate the volume of the open just fine. Yeah. All right, guys, let's take a break real quick and then we're going to talk about how you should... Uh, things you should think about and how you might want to approach the Open when it comes up this year. And what sort of steroids you should be using to crush the Open. <laughs> we'll, we'll put that'll out be, a list. That'll be the Technique Quad. Asterisk there. How to inject steroids in the Technique Quad. <laughs> in your face. <laughs> hey guys, welcome back to Technique Quad. Today we're going to go over a bar muscle up progression. Alright, so uh, some of the reasons that I like bar muscle ups over ring muscle ups. Uh, starting with that you don't have to be necessarily as strong. Um, I don't believe that most people when they start with the ring muscle ups that they can actually get into, once they actually do get into the dip, they're usually not strong enough to get out of the ring dip. 
bar muscle ups don't necessarily require that. So with that being said, bar muscle ups might be a good alternative for you to work on if you're uh, not necessarily strong enough to work on a ring dip yet. All right, so um, I'll show you a couple of bar muscle ups real quick and then I'll go over some of my uh, favorite tips and then a couple of tricks to uh, help progress so you can actually finally get your first bar muscle up or get better at them. Okay, so starting off, first thing I like is make sure you have a bar that's high enough where you can actually hang from it and your feet aren't gonna drag the ground. What this is gonna help with is making sure that you can actually stretch your legs out Make sure you're using all of your abdominals to help bring your hips up as high as you can using as much hip drive as possible. All right, so um, first prerequisite that I recommend is make sure you have a chin over vertical plane pull up. All right, make sure you're strong enough to get your chin over a vertical plane on the pull up bar, meaning if I were to draw a line through this pull up bar vertically, you can pull your chin over at the top. It'll look something like this. All right. If you've got that, you're pretty good, all right? Next would be a chest to bar pull up with your body at basically a 45 degree angle. What I mean by that is you wanna be able to get your hips high enough to where you can actually touch your chest to a bar while your body is in a 45 degree angle. So real quick, it'll look like this. All right, so that'll help because once you get your hips actually that high, you've done most of the work. From there, it's just all about transitioning yourself over the barbell, or I'm sorry, over the pull-up bar. All right, so um, one t uh, quick drill to work on is gonna be bringing your hips to the bar. So working on bringing that chest to bar, you wanna bring your hips as high to the bar. I'm not doing a chest to bar pull-up right now. I'll show you how I'm actually initiating hip drive and I'm trying to float my body up, bringing it as close to my hips as I can get it to the bar. So a slight arm bend, all using my hips, to help bring my body up and float. From there, we'll move on to the next step, but for now, I'll show you what this will look like. All right, so I did most of the work. I brought my hips high enough. Now all I've gotta do is add in the component of sitting up or transitioning over the bar. So once I bring my hips high enough, think about closing your hips like you're in a GHD sit-up machine, okay? So you'll bring your hips high, Toes are pointed, body's in a 45 degree angle, and I'm gonna quickly close my hips like I'm hinging, all right? So, real quick. So you saw it in two steps. I brought my hips up, quick GHD sit up, and then I let my toes fall. Common problem you'll see is people will bring their hips up and they'll do a, a very aggressive sit up but they get stuck at the bar. It's like they can't quite get over or they're out in front of it or behind it. The problem there is that their feet are too high. You need to keep your body in that 45 degree angle and then once you actually sit, sit up, let your toes fall. That'll help you carry around that, that, that bar and help you actually rotate around, right? So um, just to show you what I mean by that, you might see people go. If you notice, I got my hips high my toes were still way too high though. If I keep my toes down, it's gonna help me rotate around. So with that being said, one cue to remember is, hips up, when you do the sit up, let the feet fall. It'll do most of the work for you, helping you rotate around. Once you're on top of the bar, it's as simple as a kipping ring dip up, or I'm sorry, a kipping dip up. All right, you use your knees to help drive yourself out of it. Or if you're strong enough, just press out. Couple of uh, big no-nos on this. Make sure you don't over pull, right? You want your hips to help bring your body up and your arms are almost kind of, uh, you're, you're floating, right? Your arms are just kind of guiding you. You really shouldn't use a lot of arm pull. Keep your toes low, right? If you keep your toes low, it's gonna help with that transition rotating over. And then finally, remember, fast GHD sit up, right? You wanna be super aggressive. Get those hips high and quick hip hinge. Use the abs. Um, two types of dismounting. So the first is if you're just doing singles, very simple. You kip up, you press yourself out, and then you can, go, you can do like a negative dip back down and then fall out, right? Great if you're just doing singles, 
and you're not quite comfortable yet with falling completely from the top. So that'll look something like this. And then back down. Nice and easy. The second type of dismount will be when you kip up, you press out, and you completely fall back with your arms still locked. And what this helps with is if you're doing unbroken sets, it helps rebound so you can kip right back into the next one. Real quick. Cool. All right. Two limiting factors in, uh, that, that might contribute to this mobility-wise would be shoulder flexion. So I highly recommend finding some good shoulder flexion stretches. Make sure you're opening all this up because you're going to be swinging. Your body weight's coming down. That's a lot of force generated. I highly recommend spending time warming up, getting your lats loose. The second might be when you're actually coming into the dip, shoulder internal rotation. So find a good stretch there as well. It'll help the shoulders pull over that bar and help you finish that dip. Jason Khalifa, CrossFit Games champion! Jason Khalifa, ladies and gentlemen, the 2008 CrossFit Games champion! We're here. <laughs> and we're back. Barbell Shrugged <laughs> is here. Oh, it's so good Thank to be God. It's so good to be here and be alive. Drastic change in tone. Chris Moore and Doug Larson. CTP behind the camera. Brothers. Hanging we're out, looking, talking strength and fitness and strength. We're looking at Chris Moore's new book. This is the cover's Way not final. Strong. The cover's not final. They fucked up the print job, but the, the content is really delicious. Really. Uh, yeah. so, tell your story again. Yeah, tell your story. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you Chris has been through quite the ordeal in the last week. <laughs> my life's, his book. My life's, life's not fair for an author. It's fucking stupid to write books, but here's what happened. <laughs> so I, this is the first, I ordered 20 of these just to give it a test, hand out to people, get some feedback, because it's going to launch in about a month. Uh, I went ahead and ordered a big batch to follow up so I could have it in process, but I didn't click. To make a proper book on this website, you got to click certain things, and old Chris didn't click certain things, because Chris assumed wrongly that they would just sort of just fix it. Because my wife put in the orders before and they just kind of fixed it. And I didn't realize that they fix it, then you buy. You don't buy it, then they fix it. So I put in my order for 150 books. And it turns out that really all I selected was just ream after ream after ream of printed off paper. One side, <laughs> black and white fucking copy paper. I've got coming to me 15 boxes. 15 of, boxes? 15 boxes yeah, of paper. I haven't arrived. 150 copies of this book. This book is 270 pages. So it's really good stuff. It's, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But <clears throat> So if you take this book and don't print it right, what you get is 8 by 11 sheets of copy paper, 300 pages thick, Just times loose 150. No loose, unbound paper I can't way. do anything with. <laughs> okay, I knew that that happened. But, 20, but three, as you're describing it, I'm realizing like how much paper is being delivered to you. So go to... Go, how much did you spend? Tell them how much you go, spent. Go, go to your fucking... Go to Office Max and be like, how much paper I could get for 2300 fucking dollars right now? <laughs> It'd be a lot of paper. So I don't know where I'm... I, so, so what we're going to do is CTP and I have really the only idea that's serviceable in this situation. We're just going to go out in the field. We'll, we'll bring you guys along. Bring every gun and ammunition item you have. We're just going to fucking blow it all up, I think, and make a music video for Barbell Shrugged, I guess. And I think we should use nothing book. but assault rifles. I want to light shit on fire. I'm going light, to light cigars with them. We'll blow it up. We'll assault rifle the boxes. We'll just there, light there's them on nothing fire. more manly Catapult? looking. If we get Instagrams of us with guns and cigars in our mouths. Shooting. Nothing Speaking more of guns, manly than can that. Can you grow some guns if you're training for the open? <laughs> well, uh, 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 <laughs> so let me, let me wrap up this thing real quick. So... What this this book is coming, regardless of my fuck up, the book is coming December fifteenth or so. I'm not going to commit to anything right now. I got to make sure this second batch of orders comes out the right way. But it's four sections. Uh, section one on um, establishing a, po a personal philosophy for training in life. Section section two is on vice, incorporating excess in your life in a wise way to keep better balance and to get more productivity out of your life. Actually, there's a section that's just some cool pictures. The third proper section is set and setting. Because as we all know, what you do is not nearly as important as who you do it with and where you are when you fucking do it. That's important consideration, especially for training. And section four is on mindfulness. So how do you practically apply ideas of meditation and, and peace of mind to get more out of your training and more out of your life? So it's a mix of philosophy and like me going into the weeds and 
getting all artsy fartsy in the, in the writing about it. And then there's applied bits that tell you exactly what to do to take that and then use it. Right on, man. And it'll come with a strength seminar video. I did a two hour video that kind of brings 10 of these ideas out and flushes them out in a seminar talk. So it's going to come bundled with it if you get it from my website. So it's going to be pretty cool. for this one too? Fuck no. No? <laughs> <laughs> I might do it next year, but dude, here's the thing about audiobook. It takes a long time to sit down by yourself and rec- act out everything you wrote and get it recorded and packed. It's a whole other project. It takes a long time. I did that for progress. I might do it again for this. But that's not going to happen after, right now. For that passionate no you just gave me, you just said, oh, yeah, I might do it for this. <laughs> I end up always trying to do everything. Fuck it. But I got Chris, Chris always is like, oh, I'm going to take a break. And then uh, next thing I know, he's I'd wrote a book. slaving away <laughs> at, at one o'clock in the I got, morning. I've got 7,000 yeah. more words for the next book. So I don't know he's why gonna I'm doing this. He's going to be competing in the open. He won't have any time. <laughs> <laughs> competing Chris in, is doing a good job getting his back on track over there. Oh, right enough. <laughs> Great job, CTP. <laughs> he's at least, I don't know if he's doing a good job, but he's definitely trying. He's hinting at it. I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah. Knock, knock. All right. <laughs> Who's there? The open. It's the open. <laughs> By the way, you asked me about the book. I yeah, know. It's a true story. Back right. on track. All right, so we're going to go through a variety of questions about the open and just competing in general. We should do the open. You look so confused. <laughs> I can't remember where we left off before the break. Okay. <laughs> That's All right, I'm taking over now. That's my problem. Start with the right. open, maybe. All right, the open's a great competition to, to do as your very first competition, but if you have... If you have time before the open, should you do a competition before the open just as as practice or how often should you, should you compete throughout the year? Oh, that is a good question. I know. That's why we wrote very, it down on the notes. It's very practical. I have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. Kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, we'll research that. Come back to your audience. <laughs> I, I kind of like the idea of uh, doing a competition once a quarter. Uh, so once every three or four months doing something that allows you to uh, fully prep for something and also fully recover and get ready for the next thing. I think if you're doing a competition and you're, and you're going real hard in the paint for that, that particular competition, uh, doing it more frequently than that can lead to burnout. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think that three or four times a year is pretty much the ideal amount of practice. I think that allows people to build the skill of competing because the part of the thing you got to get over is just showing up to a competition, taking it way too seriously. Like mm-hmm. my life's going to end if I don't do well at this CrossFit meet. No, it won't. Nobody actually cares. Yeah. To get yeah. used to it, have fun. And then after you do it like these times, like this, I don't know what the minimal time for you will be, but three, four, five, six, seven times. And you're mm-hmm. going to go into the proper ones where you actually got to perform focused and not worked up about it. Yeah. If you don't compete semi-frequently, it's hard to relax in competition which is especially important in CrossFit because you'll, you'll gas early you can't if, freak if, you, out, if you can't just go at a, a fast but steady, relaxed pace, yeah. especially for the longer Metcons. Do you think it's like jiu-jitsu where like, you know, yeah. beginners in jiu-jitsu freak out and exhaust themselves rolling and the master is yeah. so relaxed, like, yeah, just chill. Yeah, it's but, hard to do that when you're, if you're doing fucking thrusters and you're uptight and, and stressed out, you're going to get really tired really quick. Yeah, if you saw one of the, the open launch videos or the, uh, the Road to Regionals launch videos, I talk about the 80-80 rule. Mm-hmm. And I actually kind of modified that from something I heard BJ Penn say a while back was he fights at 80%. Not 100%. He fights at 80% where, where he's fast and explosive and, and, but relaxed so he doesn't <clears throat> gas too quickly, which BJ Penn back in the day, had he was so talented, but he wasn't always in really, really good shape. Mm-hmm. As, as he got later in his career, he got in better shape. But, uh, so that was the thing for him. He didn't want to gas if, if he couldn't knock the guy out or, or, or choke him out like early in the fight. So he always fought at 80%. So I think that's a good, good advice for crossers as well. 80% basically means you're going as fast as possible, but you're doing it in a relaxed not overstimulated state. You got to sustain this. Yeah. 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 And then I think you went into, and then after 80% of the wad, maybe you spend the last 20% going uh, balls that's, that's deep. That's probably why. Yeah. That was the 80, 80 rule. 80% effort for the first 80% of the workout. So if you're doing a 20 minute AMRAP, you go 80% full speed for the first 16 minutes. And then the last four minutes, then you can really like put it on. You, you shouldn't, you shouldn't red there. line and dig deep. <clears throat> Uh, and go hard into the paint, as you just said, until the last couple minutes of the workout. That way, right as the buzzer hits, you're you're totally spent. Right. Yeah, that's that's right there why a, a typical weightlifter power that doesn't do good at CrossFit type movements with barbells, right? Because they're used to full go one rep, boom. Yeah. Which you got to train that way, but you got to feel what it's like to take that strength you develop by being explosive and backing it down and sustaining it and being smooth with it. Yeah, right. I think I that's think, a skill that's wholly di- like utilizing that strength in a controlled way, and not getting so stimulated one way to develop that skill and we were kind of talking about kind of alluding to it already which was practicing to compete i think one way to kind of practice that during a competition is to not take the competition that seriously so i find that people may choose three or four 
competitions a year. It might be a two day meet or something <clears throat> like that. And then, but they taper for it. You know, they, they want to take it seriously. They, they want to go through, they want to treat it like it was the CrossFit games or something. No, you just fucking do it. And what it is, is they, they have this big taper and then they have this big recovery afterwards. And what they should probably do is just, you know, maybe take a day or two off beforehand, treat it like training. Mm -hmm. Treat it like it's a practice. Yeah, the next week you're going to have to lower your training volume and stuff to recover from it. Because the volume of that weekend is probably higher than what you train yeah, at on a daily basis. Those are simple intuitive adjustments, though. It's no, you're not drilling down into science or right. some sort of convoluted idea to prepare yourself for something that you don't need to be doing that. Yeah, so I say pick one competition a year. And for a lot of people, it's going to be the Open. <clears throat> And really, that, that's the competition where two months out, you start making changes to your training to make it more mm -hmm. like that. And, and you're really prepping for that specific competition. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the year when you compete, just have low expectations of yourself, really. Don't worry about getting on a podium and relax and have a good time. And this is a good time to practice uh, how you fuel and all that kind of stuff, how you eat, how you rest yeah. the night before, things like that. And if you do, if you go in with low expectations, I think that you'll be more relaxed during the practice competitions. So in the end, you'll be more relaxed every time you compete. This right, is so you're saying not to change your training program leading up to <clears throat> these not so important competitions. So mm -hmm. if, the, if the open is seven months away and, and strength specifically is your goat in the off season, months and months and months away, you should be working on strength. And then if you sign up for a competition and that competition's coming up in four to six weeks, you shouldn't derail all your strength <clears throat> training and be like, man, I really need to like improve my, my Metcon fitness for this competition and totally derail your long-term goals mm -hmm. for this for this short-term competition. Yeah, actually. Just, just keep doing what you're doing and go compete just wherever you happen to be. That's actually the one of the toughest things I have as a coach is having that conversation with the athletes. You know, they want like, you know, I encourage them to do competitions. And when they do, they're like, okay, it's a month out. What do I need to do to prep? I'm like, yeah, the, nothing. This, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to keep the progression moving to get you better by the open. We're not worried about this thing in October. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to go compete, treat it like practice and you're not going to be at your best. Except that you're not going to be at your best and treat it like practice. And that's so hard because people have egos. This whole idea is like really where all your best performance comes from is these little pockets of wisdom and practical intuitive things that you, you just struggle with. Like <clears throat> my, I myself, when it came to strength, the, the best thing I ever learned was that when I started lifting heavy basically all the time, like every time I touch a barbell, I lift it as much as I can lift. It's nothing special about that. What it did for me was teach me how to not take each lifting session so seriously. So instead of like when I was a pilot, I'd run around snorting ammonia, thinking about death metal all day, getting really amped up, yelling and screaming, lifting a max weight. It's totally unnecessary. It breeds in you this uptightness. You, you take it too seriously. It adds to the fatigue and stress. If you de-emphasize it, then you can really cultivate the skill. So after a while, it becomes like, oh yeah, I compete. Or I lift a heavy weight. I just do it. And it takes nothing out of you to do it. Then when you actually, it is time to turn it on and be focused then you really have this reserve. You're recovered, you're wise, you're not getting too uptight, you're putting your focus and your arousal right where it needs to be. That's where it starts coming together, in, yeah. my, in my view. That's where the wisdom is. And regarding the tapering, uh, you know, we're kind of saying don't do a big taper. You know, you might want to spend like a week lowering the volume the week after, keeping the volume low after one of these weekend competitions. But for something like the <laughs> Open, you know, there's a... I wouldn't, I don't know if I would call it a taper, but there's a, there's a phase of training that happens like two months before that, where you the movements start looking a lot like what, you know, we know the movements look like historically. And we really start training the time that we know that, you know, we may have a higher volume uh, training and our training volume time might be really high this time of year, but it come January, that's, it's going to start shrinking. The volume's going to get lower and the intensity is going to go up this time of year. Is November, oh. if you're watching this in the future. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. <laughs> you just ruined the evergreenness. <laughs> you fucking the, the Open is, uh, yeah, the Open's in March. Uh, normally, they can move it whenever they want. And uh, it's all up to Dave Castro, I, is, is what I hear. And uh, I think yeah, it is November now, so we're like five months out right now. It's time to start getting to work. I think, I think a lot so of people you, don't talk about the coffee taper, though. Like You, you want to taper your coffee. That's because you shouldn't taper your coffee. You don't, you don't want to shit yeah, your pants kind of madness? your first competition. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Don't. <laughs> you sound really well, passionate Don't shit this. your pants, yeah. But that's another thing. Like, if, you, if, if you decide, I never, I never take anything. Maybe before my first workout, I should take a bunch of, like, you know, 
stimulants. Drink five cups of coffee, a venti, whatever oh, that venti shit is you I've drink seen every this morning. So many yeah. times. And you start going, ha, 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 and you freak out. You're tweaking out before you're supposed to compete. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's one of those. Do not change things on game day. No, that, I, I've seen what, that. What will this pill do a for a me dozen today? Times. Yeah, I've seen this happen. I don't know how many times. Like, ah. Uh, Oh my God! I've been prepping for this. I've been doing everything right. I gotta be really good. My glute then, feels sore. Then, I might want a foam roll for an hour my, before and I lift. Their, and then their friends like, "All right, what I like is Nano Explode." And their other friend likes Jack 3D. And their Rock other friend tape likes your this. Face. And he's like, "He's like, I'll just do all of them. I want to do the best." <laughs> it happens all it happens all the time. We saw a guy almost fucking die like 30, in Columbus, Ohio, from doing that that way with him. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Like, there's like 30 seconds into the wand. They're like, <laughs> and they're freaking out. And none of those stimulants <laughs> help guy, at all. That guy thought, "Oh, I'm, I'm lifting today. Might as well take this." Red line. The guy fucking <laughs> like he, had a heart he, attack. He, he had a couple of. He them. had like three. The guy, we saw the guy just collapse after they lifted. Like this guy's gonna fucking die. Collapse and go into seizure. Yeah. yeah. So don't change things on well, game day. That's, that's not us calling out red line. That was that was the doctors that came backstage. Right. And, yeah. Don't and, sue and us. They were they were telling they were telling us that this whole. That's story. what happened. This was a, this is a, we can go get the evidence of this. That's, that's not that's not our words. No. <laughs> that's, 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 that sounds that's the like our doctors. words. I will say this: there is a dosage on the can. And this guy took more than the three times that. Yeah, the prescribed dose. Why his would anyone ever do that? Not Redline's fault. His mistake. And that guy was like fifty-five or sixty years old. Yeah. Again, he, he yeah. wasn't like a twenty-year-old dude. Not this, just what you take. Trying not to get sued. It's not just what you take. It's <laughs> if, it's don't warm up differently. Don't freak out and think you're tight and start foam rolling obsessively the night before. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. One thing Louis always said this right is that before a meet, the hay is in the barn. You're not gonna get stronger this last week, but you can get weaker by doing silly shit. Don't get weaker. Don't get worse right before the show just yeah. hold your ground everything's gonna be fine don't freak out so what should your taper look like for the important competitions like the open two three weeks out how, how are you how are you ratcheting down your volume that way when the open comes around you're you're at your best and, and you're not getting weaker the week before like chris was saying by overdoing it yeah the so it kind of it depends you know anytime we talk about anything it's you know, the caveat is... No, I want a definitive answer. I came to you as a, as a content expert. Tell me what to do. That's right. That, yeah. that doesn't get mentioned enough. The answer is always it depends. <laughs> it depends. Yeah. Uh, it's hard, man. What I, what I like to do is uh, the volume is going to be higher three weeks out. Uh, that's probably like two to three weeks out. That's when things are going to be probably the most painful. Uh, that's when the intensity is going to be high. That's when that's when the volume is going to be crossing over with some intensity and you're going to hit something, some moments where the... Chris, you are messing up the microphones. That wasn't me. <laughs> it was you. I'm mean, going to get my hands off everything. I'm yeah, the, the intensity here. and the volume kind of cross over uh, around two to three weeks out. And so you're going to have a week or two where the volume and intensity are kind of relatively high and, and kind of high for both of them to exist at the same time. That doesn't happen very often. But in your competition, it does. Uh, that's when you need to take recovery most seriously because that's when people tend to get injured. You know, they're, they're prepping for it and they want to do really good. So they're, they're doing everything uh, 110% instead of 95% or whatever. And that's kind of, uh, I know this from personal experience, like, you know, timing that intensity and volume crossover, you know, poorly or hitting it too hard or trying to do extra work during that time, not a good idea. Do what your coach says. And, uh, but yeah, what's going to happen is the intensity is going to high. What that means is your workouts are going to get shorter, which means that you can push harder. And so a lot of times what I do is uh, maybe this time of year or uh, further. Sorry, I won't, I'll, I'll try to stop saying this time of year. <laughs> Jerk. If it happens to be like November. If it happens to be November. Yeah, this time of the year, uh, if you're months out from the competition, you'll be doing things that a lot of your conditioning will be at 85 to, to 90% uh, effort. And then as you get closer to the open, that's when you're starting to go more all out. Uh, two weeks out, you should be really crushing it. And then the week leading up to a competition, that's actually kind of, you kind of pull everything back. You pull the volume and intensity back, let your body adapt, let your hormones all kind of come back to pay back, to pay back your debt, higher levels. And then you can come in and kill it. Uh, for the open specifically, it being five weeks long, it's more like a season than it is a single competition. So the the taper for the open is actually a, a little more conservative. And from week to week, you've got to like take into consideration what the open one was. You got to look at the athletes. You know, one of the questions we had written down that people might have is like, you know, how should I train in between open wads? And that's going to depend on the athlete because when, when the athletes start doing the open wads, if you get completely, if you're not used to the volume or a specific movement, you're not 
you sort of are for that specific movement and you get totally destroyed, you might need to do some other things. You might need to, to lower the volume a little extra than the average person. Or maybe maybe the volume of the workout was just cake, maybe kind of sore. And you can actually ramp up the volume pretty high again on Monday if you're, if you're going to compete you gotta on Saturday. Careful. you got to be careful with that, though, because maybe but how it, you feel is not the greatest indicator. Right. <clears throat> may have, but, a, have, a, have a buddy help you measure some things to be sure that you're not that beat Yeah, up. you can look. Well, that's why you have a coach. Yeah. You know, you look at the historical data. This is what I'm used to. This is the type of volume I do well with. And then, um, you know, but if someone's really low volume training and then, and then, going how you feel may not be so good like you're saying and then you start throwing yeah. volume at them again it could just totally the send them into the simplest thing i always think about is like i just think every acute event is standalone it must be accounted for i think of it like credit card charges if i make a small charges i pay it off small charge pay it off like my normal training i know i'm doing fine i'll recover in time for the next thing but a huge event where i got to go with my buddies and crushed it and we really hit way harder than normal i went x percent above the normal normal demand I go I gotta pay this back before I do it again yeah I'm always thinking in terms of that it's always helped me just in my own mind like I know that it may not be a perfect calculation of how much I scale down or up but I know I've got to do something above and beyond to recover from that special event yeah. it means the recovery is a little extra the the eating is a little more focused on that for a few days after and it right. buffers you back and gets you back to that is definitely the, the time that is definitely the time to get hypercaloric even you, more than you think you need. And, like, and it helps you also, like, when you go, look, my training sucks. Like, I didn't do good on this week's Open. What was wrong with my training? What else happened? Like, oh, well, uh, my, my dog died or my girlfriend told me to fuck off. Other stresses that contribute to that debt. You got to keep those, those main things in mind and how things are jumping on top of you. And if it hits at the same time that big workout did, then even more work on their recovery. Just keep those common sense ideas in mind. It helps or a lot. I ordered $2,300 worth of Fuck, paper. dude, I was... <laughs> Thursday, I could have jumped off my roof. I was like, fuck! <laughs> that was really bad, but I'm, I'm so smiling about it now. Doing the open on that day would have been a poor choice. Well, I'm never going to do the open because I'm fat. So yeah. let's get that out of the way first. But that, I can do handstands. So it, it may <laughs> it sounded like I danced around the issue a little bit. You know, how do you prep? Uh, because I didn't give anything very, very concrete. But uh, well, it, it, it depends it, for it, that. It is such a, it depends. And it depends on the training history of the individual. But yeah. the average person should probably do movements that, that were not in the open. Uh, do movements that week that you can anticipate might show up. You go, oh, we already did power cleans and pull-ups. Maybe I should be ready for wall balls and, and thrusters and and uh, muscle ups this week. So mm -hmm. you can kind of try to game it a little bit uh, on just, the movement yeah. side just of to, things. Just to add some numbers to that to that abstraction. If you're if you're an expert, abstraction works great. If you're a total beginner, then abstraction is just confusing. So uh, as an, as an oversimplification, uh, say three weeks out, you you normally do five by five back squats. Uh, on Mondays, and then you do three by five back squats so the next week, and then and then you just do one by five back squats the last week, and then you compete on Saturday. So just just ratcheting it down for the three weeks out. That's oversimplified in in a million different ways, but you can see how going from five by five to three by five to one by five, and then competing on that Saturday, you won't be as beat up on that Saturday as you would have on any other normal week. And it's but it's enough work to right. keep you as strong as you were when you did the five by five. Yeah, and you certainly <clears throat> yeah you certainly won't get weaker in that situation. So don't freak out. Don't go like I'm doing less. I'm gonna show up i'm gonna shit my pants embarrass myself for everybody and god yeah. and everybody else no that won't happen yeah. yeah yeah the last two weeks leading up to a big competition really your only goal is to not feel like shit not be too beat up and not get injured stay loose right? so, stay happy so actually especially in my situation like prepping for an mma fight two weeks after an mma fight you feel like shit you get your ass kicked you got a black eye all <laughs> your joints hurt like your you've beef been, jerky you've been getting your ass kicked <laughs> And so, leading up to competition, you just want to not hurt going into a competition. You want you want your nose to not feel broken, so the first time you get punched, you don't feel like you broke your nose again. So my nose. Yeah, you just want to stay healed up. You you want that broken nose feeling to only show up like in the last round, not the very first punch, right? So same thing across it. You don't want to be all beat up all the time. No, no. So the last couple of weeks, it's okay if you have access to, to things like prowlers, and most people have access to a rower. Um, things that aren't airdyne. Gonna, airdyne, things that aren't going to beat up your joints. You can get a, a, a awesome metabolic effect without beating up your joints, without getting overly sore. And those things, 
the things that you normally use for active recovery, like rowing and aerodynes, you can do a lot of that leading up to competition without really beating yourself up, up too much. Yeah, again, yeah. don't do anything new then. Don't let go, you know, I'll try this Swedish contrast ice bath therapy a week before. <laughs> no, no, fucking try that after, man. Ease into that stuff. Just do yeah. what you normally do. Yeah. I like uh, I like the idea of, of using aerodyne and row, things that aren't going to tear your muscles up, prowler sprints, things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, practice the movements to, you can anticipate. And then you kind of get the metabolic demand through things like that because, mm-hmm. you know, during during a competition season it is going to be the time you probably get hurt because that's just when mm-hmm. you're pushing yeah. it the hardest. That's when the intensity is the highest. And, you know. You get breakdowns in form yeah. when you're really, really pushing hard. Yeah. So when the Open starts, again, it's one workout every week for five weeks. How do you manage the training time in between each Open wad? So between you do the first wad on Saturday and next Saturday you got wad two. What do you do that week? How do you how do you manage training hard enough to stay in as good a shape as possible? Maybe even get in a tiny bit little better shape, but not again overdoing it. Where when you show up for wad number two, you're beat up and you're tired and you're and you're not as ready as you could be. Actually, one thing I like to do is chicken sacrifice to Joe Boo. Then what? <laughs> After the chicken sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Boo bless bats. Then I train. I <laughs> uh, actually like right after, right after, especially if you're only doing one workout in a day, like the open. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I like to do is do like maybe a 10 minute AMRAP of some like recovery movements. Do some things, just get blood flowing again. Uh, you don't want to end on, uh, I don't, I don't like lending, ending on a high lactic mm-hmm. uh, threshold type workout. Mm-hmm. So, when you finish and you're like on the ground and rolling around and everything hurts and everything burns. Flopping like, oh, like a salmon. Wait 10, 20 minutes and then go do a 10 minute AMRAP of like kettlebell swings, like mm-hmm. movements that aren't going to tear you up. Kind of do get on the air dine, you know, work on some double unders. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably a good time to work on some movements that you might not be good at that you might anticipate the next week. You know, you're fatigued and now you're practicing double unders. You suck at double unders. Maybe it's time to practice that. And so I kind of like practicing the skills you might suck at that you can anticipate a week from now while you're like completely destroyed. I had a conversation years ago with a guy. You reminded me of it. We were talking about what you finish with with a workout. And we actually get, we're, we were grad students at the time who took things a little too seriously. So we're getting into like genetics research and thinking about this. But he he was, we talked about research. I, I'll, I'll zoom up to a practical level for this, but I think you want to end the workout and with the kind of adaptation or the kind of feeling you want to be left with. Like, you don't want to get off the floor and mosey out of the gym like you feel like shit. Because everything right. else the rest of that day is kind of like that. And the adaptation that you're kind of left with is a sticky one where you got to do a lot of recovery to get good again. But if you leave the gym getting over it and feeling good and bouncy again, that's a much better way to end any training session. Uh, psychologically, I think. Psychologically, uh, they, they look at molecularly everything. It's like if you watch a comedian and if at the very end of the show it's like not that exciting... Or you end with a flop. Which we <laughs> last week. Mm-hmm. Oh, shit. It's so like, yeah, we went and saw a comedian. And, you know, like, the high point was in the middle, and then it just kind of went down from there. And then at and, the end, we were like, oh, and, that And it doesn't matter how funny he was. Yeah, it doesn't matter how it was funny. like, that show sucked because it didn't end on a high note. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, not only practicing your ghost, but it's probably a great time to do some things you're really good at yeah. also. So you can end <clears> on a high note from a psychological perspective. You can... You know, flush out everything. It's really meaningful yeah. to do. If you want to learn more about that, you can watch Daniel Kahneman's TED Talk. He talks a lot about finishing on a high note and people's memory of something, especially like something really painful. Oh, yeah. mm-hmm. If you if you give somebody like an intense amount of pain, like like during or after surgery, and then you go, okay, it's done, and they had like a big spike of pain right before you said it was done, they'll remember it as having been way more painful than if you give them that big spike of pain and then you say it's not done, it's not done, it's not done. And then they're they're kind of like coming down off of it, and then you say it's done after they're well off of that big spike. They remembered as <clears throat> as having been way less painful, even if the total quantifiable amount of pain was was more. So if if you're doing five weeks of open wads, and I know that for myself and for some of the athletes we've had, it's psychologically demanding every week to push all the way to the edge. You know, if you don't end on that, maybe. Maybe then, you know, you'll be able to approach the next week with a little bit fresher mind. Uh, you know, the coming, say you do the, the open workout on Monday or on a, a Saturday, you know, and then you, you do something nice and easy, work on some goats, practice some things, mm-hmm. flush everything out that afternoon. And then on Monday, the training again, I, I like to lift something heavy and uh, kind of get, get, I don't want to go like anything that's when you want to do stuff that's as far from what you're going to see at the open as possible, probably, mm-hmm. you know, what you might anticipate that week, maybe do something long and easy. And then as the week progresses again, 
get the intensity high. So it's going to be like mini tapers within the open. So you might do like a five by five back squat. Mm -hmm. that, that might be a little high for most people on Monday. And then you do uh, maybe a 20 minute AMRAP, but you, you go at like 90%. And then on Tuesday, you might keep it short and intense. Wednesday, long. And Thursday, short and intense again, mm -hmm. and then you crush the wad again on Saturday for the next week. Yeah, it's actually a very similar situation to what, what starters in baseball have, the, the starting pitchers in baseball. Um, Major League Baseball, they have a five-day cycle. They, they pitch every five days. They open the game. Uh, and college is every seven days. So they're on, they're on a cycle and a routine where they know that they're going to throw again every five days. There's, there's five pitchers, and they just go on rotation. One yeah. pitcher, and then the next, and the next, and the next. And then when they're back up five days later, they go again. And so if you're watching a Major League Baseball game, the star goes out out there he throws and then oftentimes right when he gets done he goes inside and trains because he so only he goes in and squats yeah, that's right yeah. that's exactly what he does he yeah. goes in and does his heavy lower body day right after he throws his arms tired so he doesn't train his arm that much he might do a little bit of cuff exercise not nothing too, too crazy but he'll go in and he'll tax his legs that way he has maximum time to recover right um, the the joints and the muscles that weren't already taxed from throwing Grant, I don't want to get into a big debate about yeah, you, you use your legs when you're throwing and, not, and all that. That's not the point. <laughs> um, but the point is that he wants to tax his legs. That way, when he goes to throw the next time, he's as recovered as possible. But because it's a, the point is that squatting taxes the arm. Like, you can't just, like, expect the training, that heavy training session to have no effect on that arm, too. So if you went ahead and fucking did that the next day, you're it prolonging the fatigue. Yeah, they've looked at hormone studies, too. You know, if you do heavy squats on one day for days after that, you know, your testosterone is going to be a little bit higher. Yeah, and practically, it's, it's not like you don't weigh pretty ideal. And you're holding that weight with that fucking arm and it's tired. It's going to be even more fatigued just practically. So that's another practical Pitching question. Pitching easy. What are you talking about, man? <laughs> that's, a weird, that's a weird position. That's a fascinating position. It with is. With those guys, it's a very huge skill, huge, like isolated the forces at that shoulder and what your body does and the way it's kind of imbalanced. Like it's just so different, a case study and, and training an athlete. That's a fun exercise to do. When, as you guys know, I was a, a strength coach for the Colorado Rockies in 2006 and being able to like just play catch with some of those guys is, oh, is, a, is a freaky experience. Different world. You, you can hear the ball sizzling as it comes to you. It's like, like fuck, fuck, fuck. You stick your hand up with a glove. Oh God, just, just don't hit me. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had, that, really I had that experience when I used to, I played college football and everything. I would throw, play catch with the starting quarterback yeah like we had a couple of really good quarterbacks that not that we don't do now i'm saying this is my experience but like to get to get like 20 yards away from that guy and have him you just see him look right at you and throw the ball right there like release his finger pointing right between your eyes and then you just see a ball go sue like on a razor right <laughs> towards your face and you just go <gasps> and just go <laughs> sticks to your hands like, oh fuck thank god i caught that <laughs> <laughs> all right so from a, a practical point of view how do you know when to take a day off you got five weeks where you have to be at your best. How do you know when you need to take a day off? Ooh. It's a big, Ooh. it depends question too. That's tough. I, you know what I do? Not having no experience in this, just talking <laughs> out of my ass. I, I test my vertical jump this whole time. And when it goes down, I know I'm not quite ready to do that's, it. It's actually, a lot, of, a lot of coaches do use that. That's not a bad way of going about it. Yeah, uh, I, yeah it depends on, uh, you know, how experienced the athlete is. You know, if an athlete's been doing this thing for five, six, seven years, they probably know. If they go, hey, I'm feeling beat up. Like, um, you know, it, it, this is actually some. I, I coach uh, one really advanced athlete. And she's like, I feel really bad. I think I need to take tomorrow off. I'm like, do it. Mm -hmm. And then I also have some other athletes that aren't as advanced. They're like, I'm feeling really beat up. I'm like, okay. Shut like, up. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm looking at the numbers, and it's it's a little bit like that. So mm -hmm. I think using a vertical jump test for somebody who may not be as experienced could be really good. What he's talking about is, did you explain it? No, well, I'll, I'll, I'll say, let you explain it. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've known a lot of research and stuff that we were even participating in that one of the first things that go, one of the early canaries in your coal mine will be your ability to produce force, I guess, fast sprinting. And if your sprints and runs and jumps and bounds and maybe Olympic lifts feel a little sticky, uh, it's not nothing you don't freak out about, but you know it's probably an early sign that things are, fatigue's accumulating, things are getting a little down. <clears throat> and if you can take a little break and you feel zippy again, then that's, because the strength thing, the the ability to crush a wide is probably going to be the last thing to go. You can, be, you can still pump out good strength work, but this whole time you're you're getting slower and slower and slower. You just can't quite tell. I always use that like my power thing. When I want to squat really maximum weights, I know a, the faster I was going to be, the better shot I had at doing that. Strength alone wasn't the mark I needed to measure fatigue by. Right. So what happens if HQ just decides none of these barbell movements, none of these body weight movements, it's all kettlebells and running and no AMRAPs, Fuck. Where, where are we going to be at then? Well, <coughs> you'll be in better shape. <laughs> <laughs> you'll be a better person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's one of those things where I, I, I will be completely honest that uh, 
most of our predictions, most of my predictions are based off historical data. And, and if they change, uh, they the probably will. If they change the competition drastically. Uh, it's going to be tough. It's an unlikely yeah. scenario. I think the, the likely scenario is most of it is just what we've seen, and that might be a curveball or two. And in which case, you're, you're prepared probably for the curveball. Yeah, ball. we're yeah. Uh, we definitely. Um, I definitely spend some time picking out those movements that you might see in regionals, and I like to throw those in to people and for people who are prepping for the open mm-hmm. for two reasons. One is yeah, the potential curveball. More than likely, they're going to throw in. If they do throw a curveball in the open, it'll probably be something that was done at regionals, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other thing is, is hey, you make it at regionals. At least you're practicing those movements that were historically at regionals as well. So Because yeah. you're, you're doing the things that are – you're going back and working on foundation anyway, which is going to help you do the things in the future. It's not like it's a bad thing. Like, oh, I fucked up the strategy. No, it's still a great strategy no matter what. You worked on fundamentals and you got stronger. You're better. Right. <laughs> Universally yeah. better. If you're pretty strong at all the basic barbell movements and you can do all of the gymnastics movements, you know, muscle-ups, chest bar pull-ups, handstand push-ups, pistols, if you can do all those movements unbroken – then you're probably okay for the open. Yeah. Regardless of what happens. Uh, I've seen weightlifters, a lot of weightlifters, they, one of the things that they do really well is they move really well. And you see the same thing with gymnasts is yep. they are masters of like movement, right? So you throw them into CrossFit a lot of times, they can, they pick up on the skills unusually fast. You're like, man, I can't believe that weightlifter was able to like learn how to do kipping pull-ups so well. And you take that gymnast is like, man, they move really well with the bar on that snatch. So like, well, they understand they have motion. the fundamentals down. Yeah, they understand how things work. And so, yeah. And then it's easy to add on the metabolic adaptation to that with just a couple of years of committing to it and developing it to get competitive if they wanted to do it. it yeah, I mean, years. if you take Kendrick now and try to make him do a Y, somebody's like, there, I saw Kendrick do that Y, he didn't do so good. He wasn't trying. That's an important thing to note. He wasn't trying, didn't give a shit about it. He's just showing his motion. If he trained and worked on it, he would certainly get a lot better. Because what the you mean by trying there. is by, you mean prepping. Prepping. Because he was trying. Like, make it important <laughs> enough to change your training to right. get better at that thing, which, which he wasn't not doing. Do. He doesn't care no. about that. No, he just was having fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. A year of conditioning, he would be completely different. Yeah, he's a for, for the CrossFit stuff. He'd be a monster he would, anything. He would crush. He's he's a he's a same goes for a lot of good weightlifters, man. They're just they're moving really well. I mean, I've learned that so much in my own life this year. Like, really, the first thing that needs to happen is you move really excellent, as excellent as possible, and you always work on that. Then you add load back to that. That's been my greatest lesson coming out of powerlifting was to drop that shit. I, th- I think one thing that's one thing the open will will point out, especially if you have people judging you or you're got to move well, man. Yeah, you all of a sudden those uh, those half ass thrusters and and the <laughs> chest bar pull ups you counted in your workout, but the judge feel, isn't counting now. You're gonna feel really naked. Yeah, out there. yeah. So yeah, as Chris said, master the movement. Don't worry about the load or the volume. And just do that and then start adding in slowly. The return on your check investment. Ego. The return yeah. on your investment from that is so fucking huge. If you do shitty reps, you're gonna have a It's like a steroid time. effect, I'd say <laughs> it's like a steroid effect. If you get if you move better, get used to it, then add load back in, you're really shocked at how well you can lift and move and, yeah, and do these motions. Sure. It's so crazy. All right, guys. Speaking of ending on high notes, yay! <laughs> We're taking off, and we will see you next week. Make sure to go to barbellstroke.com, sign up for the newsletter. If you enjoyed this podcast, over to iTunes, leave a positive comment, five stars. If you leave me less than five stars, don't do anything. Everyone tell us how good we look. <laughs> go buy and Chris's go book. buy Chris's book. Keep your eyes peeled Way for that one. Way past wrong. It's good. <laughs>